So guys, happy uh, happy Wednesday, and uh, you know it is uh, Wednesday, January twenty sixth, and um, I want to share something with you guys today that for me it was first shared with me when I was a nineteen year old. I was a freshman at the University of North Carolina Wilmington, and I was getting ready to embark on my sales career. Never really been in sales. I'd had a whole bunch of jobs most in, in, uh, in fast food and other restaurants, um, but never in the arena of sales. And so it was different. And uh, I went to the uh, on-campus apartment of a friend of a friend and heard about this summer sales inter internship where uh, he went out in the Midwest and sold books door to door, 80 hours a week. And uh, the average first year student would bring, would bring home a check for $5,000. And I thought, hmm, I made $2,000 last summer working my butt off in, in construction. 5,000 sounds better. I'll do that. And um, it took some convincing from my parents to be able to be to go do it, but worked hard that summer, didn't have a car, just went out and walked all summer long in uh, Danville, Illinois, and um, ended up with a check when the summer was over for $5,020. So basically average. So hopefully um, sharing that, I mean, hopefully that the message going through on that one is you don't have to be a rock star start. You don't have to, it's not how you start, but how you finish. Uh, I got better my next summer, got a little better my next summer. And it was about summer number four uh, when I actually, well, actually the end of summer number three, where I actually learned how to sell. I started selling the sizzle, not the steak. It took me a while. I'm not, a, I'm not the fastest learner, the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'll work hard and persevere. But guys, right before that summer, my manager shared with me a little pamphlet. Okay. And I think I've still got the same pamphlet. It's uh, it's old and tattered. Uh, it's, it's somewhere packed, but I've got the old one. It's called the common denominator of success by someone named Albert E. N. Gray. And guys, I want to share it with you today. It's been emailed to each of each of you this morning uh, earlier. So it's right at the top of your inbox. If you have access to a printer, I would encourage you to print it up and have a paper copy in front of you and either a highlighter or a pen where you can underline, you can take some little, some notes, um, and, and Kyle and I can make sure that each of you guys do get this in pamphlet form at some point. But uh, man, this was a game changer for me. Um, and I just want to share it with you guys today. One of the most powerful morning meetings that I ever, ever experienced on a train more uh, was with Peter Ferre and three other new agents and me sitting around a table in a diner. And we actually dissected the common denominator of success. And uh, it just was like, wow. And every guy, I'll tell you what, I like to go back and read this about once a month. OK, and I tell you, every time I read this, this little piece, that's just I'm not having even still, I'm just not. Having hey, whoever's talking, if you could mute yourself or Kyle, if you can figure out who that is talking and mute them, no, that'd I'm be right. great. Not sure who that is. Um, someone's on the phone. Travis Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Just mute, buddy. Um, so, um, yeah, let me share this with you guys here um, real quick. But it's it's a it's a game changer, guys. Um, the common denominator of success, the secret of success of every man. By the way, guys, in here where it says it says man, this is old school every time, just man or woman. Just please, I'm not going to do that every single time for, for time's sake, but um, every person, every human um, where it says man. So just, um, just be aware of that. But the secret of success of every man who's ever been successful lies in the fact that he formed the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. The common denominator of success is a timely and inspira inspirational um, as it was when it was first delivered in 1940, guys, over 80 years ago. Uh, though it was written for life insurance professionals, its message is equally well suited uh, to anyone in, in the sales profession um, or anyone in any, any field of endeavor who seeks success in their professional, personal, or spiritual lives. So guys, this is apl applicable across the board, not just in sales. The inspiring message by, by Mr. Gray is one of the most timeless pieces of life insurance literature. It first appeared uh, as a major address in 1940, uh, National Association of Life Underwriters Annual Convention in Philadelphia and has been available to associate members in pamphlet form ever since. Although our authors passed away as words of wisdom and moving philosophy so manifest in the common denominator of success are part of the current life insurance scene and of real meaning for today's professional life and supplemental underwriter. Uh, Mr. Gray was an uh, official of the Prudential Insurance Company of America and had 30 years of continuous experience both in the, in the, as an agent in the field and as a promoter and instructor in sales development. He was known throughout the country as a writer and speaker on, on life insurance subjects. Several years, here we go, guys. Several years ago, 
<clears throat> I was brought face to face with the very disturbing realization that I was trying to supervise and direct the efforts of a large number of men who were trying to achieve success without knowing myself what the secret of success really was. And that naturally brought me face to face with the further realization that regardless of what other knowledge uh, I might have brought to my job, I was definitely lacking in the most important knowledge of all. Of course, like most of us, I'd been brought up with the popular belief that the secret of, of success is hard work, that I'd seen so many men work hard without succeeding, and so many men succeeding without working hard that I'd become convinced that hard work was not the real secret, even though in most cases it might be one of the requirements. And so I set out on a voyage to discover, of discovery, which carried me through biographies and autobiographies and all sorts of dissertations on success and the lives of successful men until I finally reached a point at which I realized that the secret I was trying to discover lay not only in what men did, but what made them do it. I realized further that the secret for which I was searching must not only apply to every definition of success, but since it must apply to everyone to whom it was offered, it must also apply to everyone who had ever been successful. In short, I was looking for the common denominator of success. And because that is exactly what I was looking for, that's exactly what I found. Guys, there's a little piece in there right there too. You get what you're looking for, okay? If you're looking for problems, you find problems. If you look for solutions, you find solutions. If you look for success, you find success. But this common denominator of success is so big, so powerful, and so vitally important to your future and mine that I'm going to not going to make a speech about it. I'm just going to lay it on the line in words of one syllable, so simple that anyone can understand them. The common denominator of success, the secret of success of every man who's ever been successful lies in the fact that he formed the habit of doing the things that failures don't like to do. I'll repeat it, guys. The secret of success of every man or woman who's ever been successful lies in the fact that he formed the habit of doing the things that failures don't like to do. It's just as true as it sounds and as simple as it seems. You can hold it up to the light, you can put it to the acid test, you can kick it around till it's worn out, but when you're all through with it, it'll be the, the common denominator of success, whether you like it or not. I will, it will still explain why uh, men have come into the business of ours with every apparent qualification for success and given us our most disappointing failures, while others have come in and achieved outstanding success in spite of many obvious and discouraging handicaps. And since it will also explain your future, it would uh, seem to be a mighty good idea for you to use it in determining just what sort of future you're going to have. In other words, let's take this big all-embracing secret and boil it down to fit the individual you. If the secret of success lies in forming the habits of doing the things that failures don't like to do, let's start with boiling down the boiling down process by determining what are the things that failures don't like to do. The things that failures don't like to do uh, are the very things that you and I and other human beings, including successful people, naturally don't like to do. In other words, we got to realize right from the start that success is something which is achieved by the minority of men, and therefore unnatural, and not to be achieved by following our natural likes and dislikes, nor being guided by our natural pre uh, preferences and prejudices. The things that failures don't like to do in general are too obvious for us to discuss them here, and so, since our success is to be achieved in the, in the, the sale of supplemental insurance, let's move uh, on to a discussion of things that we, as supplemental insurance uh, agents, don't like to do. Here, the things we don't like to do are too many to permit specific discussion, but I think they can all be deposed, disposed of being, uh, of, by saying uh, that they all emanate from one basic dis, uh, dislike particular to all types of selling. We don't like to call on people who don't want to see us and talk to them about something they don't want to talk about. Any reluctance to follow a definite prospecting program, to use prepared sales talks, to organize time and to organize effort are all caused by this one basic dislike. Guys, that's worth underlining right there. <laughs> uh, perhaps you've wondered, uh, what is behind this particular lack of welcome on the part of our prospective buyers? Isn't it due to the fact that our prospects are human too? And isn't it true that the average human is not big enough to buy life insurance on his own accord and therefore prone to escape our efforts to make them bigger or persuade them to do something he doesn't wanna do by striking at the most important weakness we have, namely our desire to be appreciated. Perhaps you've been discouraged by the feeling that you were born subject to certain likes, dislikes particular to you with which the successful men in our business are not afflicted. 
Perhaps you've wondered why it is that our biggest producers seem to like to do the things that you don't like to do. <laughs> Guess what? They don't. And I think this is the most encouraging statement I've ever offered to a group of supplemental uh, insurance agents. Um, but if they don't like to do these things, then why do they do them? Because by doing the things that they don't like to do, they can accomplish uh, the things that they want to accomplish. Successful men are influenced by the desire for pleasing results. Failures are influenced by the desire for pleasing methods and are inclined to be satisfied with such results as can be obtained by doing things that they like to do. Why are successful men, I guess that's, that's huge right there. Right there, it's a, mm. why are successful men able to do things they don't like to do while failures are not? Because successful men have a purpose strong enough to make them form the habit of doing things that they, um, doing things they don't like to do in order to accomplish the purpose they want to accomplish. Big, big guys, successful men have a purpose strong enough to make them form the habit of doing things they don't like to do in order to accomplish the purpose they want to accomplish. Sometimes even our best producers get into a slump. When a man goes into a slump, it's, it simply means that he's reached a point at which for the time being, the things he doesn't like to do have become more important than his reasons for doing them. And may I pause and suggest to you managers and leaders and general agents that when one of your good producers goes into a slump, the less you talk about his production and the more you talk about his purpose, the sooner you'll pull him out of that slump. Guys, when the man's right, his world's right, right? Many men with whom I've discussed the common honor of success have said at this point, but I have a family to support and I have to, I have to have a living for my family and myself. Isn't that enough purpose? Nope. No, it isn't. It isn't sufficiently a strong enough purpose to make you form the habit of doing the things you don't like to do for the very simple reason that it's easier to adjust ourselves to a, the hardships of a poor life than it is to adjust ourselves to the hardships of making a better one. If you doubt me, just think of all the things you're willing to go without in order to avoid the things you don't like to do, all of which seem to prove that the strength which holds you to your purpose is not your own strength, but the strength of the purpose itself, okay? Now, let's see why habit belongs so importantly in this common denominator of success. Men are creatures of habit, just as machines are creatures of momentum. For habit is nothing more than momentum translated from the concrete into the abstract. Can you picture the problem that would face our mechanical engineers if there was no such thing as momentum? Speed would be impossible because the highest speed at which any vehicle could be moved would be the first speed at which it could be broken away from a standstill. Elevators cannot be made to rise. Airplanes cannot be made to fly. And the entire world of mechanics would find itself in a total state of helplessness then who are you and I to think that we can do with our own human nature what the finest engineers in the world cannot do with the finest machinery that was ever built? Every single qualification for success is acquired through habit. Men form habits and habits form futures. Guys, I'll repeat that. Men and women form habits and our habits form our futures. If you do not deliberately form good habits, then you unconsciously, you will form bad ones. Guys, if you don't consciously form the habit of talking to people every single day about the opportunity uh, with, our, with our, our career, you are unconsciously and accidentally forming the bad habit of not doing it. And if you're a leader, you're gonna be accidentally teaching your new agents to do the same thing. You are the kind of man you are because you have formed the habits of being that kind of man. And the only way you can change is through habit. The success habits in life insurance and supplemental insurance selling are divided into four main groups, prospecting habits, calling habits, selling habits, and working habits. Let's discuss these habit groups in their order. Pause for coffee. Any successful life insurance salesman will tell you that it's easier to sell life insurance to people who don't want it than it is to find people who want it. And guys, you ever notice if you find someone who wants it, they probably don't qualify for it. <laughs> um, if you've not deliberately formed the habit of prospecting for needs, regardless of wants, then unconsciously you form the habits of limiting your prospecting to people who want 
supplemental insurance. And therein lies the only, the one and only reason for lack of prospects. As to calling habits, unless you've deliberately formed the habit of calling on people who are able to buy, but unwilling to listen, then unconsciously you form the habit of calling on people who are willing to listen, but unable to buy. You guys ever notice that people with no money, they'll talk to you all day long, right? People that have money are less, are less likely to, okay? As to selling habits, unless you've deliberately formed the habit of calling on prospects determined to make them see their reason for buying supplemental insurance, then unconsciously you form the habit of calling on prospects in a state of mind in which you're willing to let them make you see their reasons for not buying it. Guys, there's a saying, and there's a sale made on every single demo. Either you sell them a policy or they sell you on their excuse why they're not going to buy. As to working habits, if you'll take care of the other three groups, the working habits will generally take care of themselves because under working habits include study and preparation, organization of time and efforts, records, analysis, et cetera. Certainly, you're not going to take the trouble to learn interest arousing approaches and sales talks unless you're going to use them. Okay, You're not going to plan your day's work when you know in your heart that you're not going to carry out your plans. And you're certainly not going to keep an honest record of things that you haven't done or results that you haven't achieved. So let's not worry so much about the fourth group of success habits. For if you're taking care of the first three groups, most of the working habits will take care of themselves. You'll be able to afford a secretary to take care of the rest of them for you. Um, but before you decide to adopt these habits, let me warn you of the importance of habit in your decision. I've attended many sales meetings and sales congresses during the past 10 years and have wondered why, in spite of the fact that there's so much good in them, so many men seem to get so little lasting good out of them. Perhaps you've attended sales meetings in the past where you've left determined to do the things that you, would make you successful or more successful only to find your decision, to, uh, your decision or determination waning at just the time when, it, when you should be putting it into practice. Here's the answer. Any resolution or decision you make is simply a promise to yourself which isn't worth a tinker's dam unless you form the habit of making it and keeping it. And you won't form the habit of making it and keeping it unless right from the start, you link it with a definite purpose that can be accomplished by keeping it. I'll repeat that sentence, guys. And you won't form the habit of making it and keeping it unless right from the start, you link it with a definite purpose that can be accomplished by keeping it. In other words, any resolution or decision you make today has to be made again tomorrow and the next day, and the next, and the next, and so on. And it not only has to be made each day, but it has to be kept each day. For if you miss one day in the making or keeping of it, you got to go back and begin all over again. It sounds a lot like 75 hard. Um, but if you continue to pr the process of making it each morning and keeping it each day, you'll finally wake up some morning in a different, uh, different man in a different world, and you wonder, What's happened to you in the world that you used to live in? Here's what happened. Your resolution or decision has become a habit and you don't have to make it on this particular morning. And the reason for you seeming like you're, you're like a different man living in a different world lies in the fact that for the first time in your life, you become master of yourself and master of your likes and dislikes by surrendering to your purpose in life. That's why behind every success, there must be a purpose uh, that is what makes purpose so important to your future. For in that last analysis, your future is not going to depend on economic conditions or outside influences or circumstances over which you have no control. Your future is going to depend on your purpose in life. So let's talk about purpose, guys. Um, a lot of you have said, oh, gosh, what's my purpose? I don't, I don't know how to figure this out. Guys, purpose can change over time, okay? My purpose today uh, 20 years in is very different than what my purpose was my first couple months in this business. First of all, your purpose must be practical and not visionary. Some time ago, I talked with a man who thought he had a purpose, which was more important to him than income. He was interested in the sufferings of his fellow man, and he wanted to be placed in a position to alleviate that suffering. But when he analyzed his real feeling, we discovered, and he admitted it, what he really wanted was a real nice job dispensing charity with other people's money and being well paid for it along with the appreciation and feeling of importance that would naturally go with such a job. <laughs> um, but in making your purpose practical, be careful not to make it logical. Make it a purpose of the sentimental or emotional type. Remember, needs are logical, while wants and desires are sentimental and emotional. 
Your needs will push you just so far, but when your needs are satisfied, they will stop pushing you. If, however, your purpose is in terms of wants and desires, then your wants and desires will keep pushing you long after your needs are satisfied and until your wants and desires are fulfilled. Recently, I was talking to a young man who long ago discovered the purpose, uh, who discovered the common denominator of success without identifying his discovery. He had a definite purpose in his life and it was definitely a sentimental or emotional purpose. He wanted his boy to go through college without having to work his way through as he had done. He wanted to avoid for his little girl, the hardships which his own sister had had to face in her childhood. And he wanted his wife and the mother of his children to enjoy the luxuries and comforts and even necessities which had been denied his own mother. And he was willing to form the habit of doing things he didn't like to do in order to accomplish this purpose. Not to discourage him, but rather to encourage, for him to encourage me, I said to him, aren't you going a little too far with this thing? There's no logical reason why your son shouldn't be willing and able to work his way through college just as his father did. Of course, he'll miss many of the things that you missed in your college life. and He'll probably have heartaches and disappointments, but if he's any good, he'll come through in the end just as you did. And there's no logical reason why you should have to slave in order that your daughter um, may have things in which your own sister wasn't able to have or in order that your wife can enjoy comforts and luxuries that she wasn't used to before she married you. He looked at me with a rather pitying look and said, Mr. Gray, there's no inspiration in logic. There's no courage in logic. There's not even happiness in logic. The only sat there's only satisfaction. The only place logic has in my life is in the realization that the more I'm willing to do for my wife and my children, the more I shall be able to do for myself. Imagine after hearing that story, you won't, you won't have to uh, be told how to find your purpose or how to identify it or how to surrender to it. If it's a big purpose, you'll be big in its accomplishment. If it's an unselfish purpose, you'll be unselfish in accomplishing it. And if it's an honest purpose, you'll be honest and honorable in the accomplishment of it. But as long as you live, don't ever forget that while you may succeed beyond your fondest hopes and your greatest expectations, you'll never succeed beyond the purpose to which you're willing to surrender. Furthermore, your surrender will not be complete until you form the habit of doing the things that failures don't like to do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is the common denominator of success. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second. I'd love to hear uh, a few people, uh, maybe a couple things that maybe spoke to you that you maybe underlined, notes you, you put out in the margins. Um, I'm just going to open it up. Hey, man, hey, this is hey, Maria. Man. Um, I thought that it was interesting how he, he talks about logic, the way your purpose uh, can't necessarily just be purely logical and that if you make it emotional, it kind of holds more weight. Absolutely. Man, it's Todd. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, no, it's just cool because the same things, the same goals that he had, you know, wife, son, daughters, um, same goals I have, but it drives me every day to try and get out there and do the best that I can so that, you know, I'm not trying to spoil them. They're spoiled. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's what fuels me to get out there and do what I do is to have their lives not be like mine. You know, um, I worked three jobs in college and uh, my dad tells everybody I went to school long enough to be a doctor because I was there for seven years, but I'm not a doctor. But, uh, you know, I just don't want I want them to have a life I didn't have. So it, it's definitely the fuel. So I appreciate that. It was good to hear Thanks for sharing, Todd. I say ditto to Todd. Um, pretty much the same story. My husband tells me I was in school long enough to be a doctor as well. So I don't want that for my kids. That's awesome. Any, anybody else without kids get anything from that? Uh, hey, um, so I actually don't have kids. Uh, I guess for me, it was just realizing that 
you know, life is hard no matter who you are. I'm sure all of us have had our struggles and things like that. Um, but also it's how you get through them and it's what you see kind of beyond the struggle and just really holding on to that and making sure that that's the most important thing to you so that you have a reason to get up every day and kind of I've started to do this a little bit I'm still new um, but every time I'm kind of thinking about not doing something or man that doesn't sound the best I just kind of go back over it in my head and be like, you know, you're only as strong as your determination to succeed. And then I'll get up and go do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing that, Charlie. Okay. So one more thing is I am really reading the greatest salesman in the world book. Like it says to read each scroll for 30 days. Well, I'm not doing that. Um, but I am, I have my process, but it talks, it also talks about the habits in here. And that's really what the greatest salesman talks about two is at the beginning of the scrolls is the habits and you have to form good habits because bad habits obviously so that's something just the word habit honestly it's kind of repetitive yeah yeah that's a big one in there if you're not consciously forming good ones guys you're unconsciously forming bad ones habits are being formed every day whether we whether we're doing it on purpose or not Hey, man, I'll talk. It's uh, in the book itself, just page 11. Just the quote. I think about this if I ever feel the, the word we, we hate to hear what is called unmotivated because uh, motivation we all know lasts for about 30 minutes and then it wears off. So just think about the common denominator of success lies in the fact that he or she formed the habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. It's OK not to wake up at the exact same time every day, super early, and it's OK not to want to study your sales talk at night, but just think the felt the, the successful people form the habit of doing things that people don't like to do. So just whenever you're, you're in a rut or whenever you're thinking, should I do this? Just think back to that basic quote, because that is just one on one doing the things that failures don't like to do, regardless of how you feel. So you may not want to study at night after an eight hour work day. You may not want to wake up at 530 every single day or go to the gym in the morning, but you must do those to be successful. And just, you know, just doing more, doing more hard decisions and easy decisions um, leads you to success. Um, yeah, this is great, man. Thank you. Hey, man, one of the, one of the things again, man, it just reminds me when Kyle said that, you know, my brother said to me a while ago, um, Todd, I couldn't do the job that you do. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, because the nervousness would make me not get out of the car. And I'd be too nervous. And my response was, that same nervousness I feel, but it fuels me to get out of the car. Because I'm not one to let that overcome me and control me. I'm one to go, you know what, man? It, it, that's just, it's just my mind playing tricks on me. Get out of the car, go in there. And a lot of times, guys, it's a lot, it's a hell of a lot less intimidating in the business or whatever than it is for you to actually be in there. So. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing, man. <clears throat> well, guys, and you um, had, never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead, Casey. I was going to say you had mentioned the 75 hard thing. Um, when Todd and I did that, some of the greatest days that I had, honestly, were the times that, you know, I'd fall asleep with Olivia at night and had not completed my last 45 minute workout and I'd have to get up, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and go freaking out for a job. But it was the most like rewarding part of it. It's no different than not wanting it to go into a business and you're sitting in your car terrified. But when you make yourself go in there and do it, when you come out, you're like, holy crap. Um, it's just more motivation um, to keep doing the hard stuff, honestly. And then it just becomes a new habit. It absolutely does. Thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> well, guys, um, I hope everyone um, gleaned something uh, from that. I hope you I hope you took some notes on it. I hope you underlined a few things. And guys, I hope too that you'll go back and you'll revisit this because somebody mentioned it earlier. Uh, Kyle did it, that. You know, motivation is temper. You know, motivation doesn't last, guys. And you know what? Neither does neither does bathing, which is why it's recommended that you do it every day. So just kind of keep that in mind that revisiting these things and, 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 and repetition is the mother of all learning. Um, and if you think you're prone to forget to go back and review this, 
take your phone and go ahead and once a month or twice a month, have a little reminder that pops up that says, read the common denominator of success. Um, it took me 20 minutes to read it out loud, guys. Reading it um, to yourself without, without your mouth involved, you can probably do it in about 12. Um, so it's not a big, it's not a, it's not a big ask, but it sure does pay big dividends uh, when it's done. So guys, um, have a great day today. Let's go out and do some things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do so that we can accomplish the purpose that we set out to accomplish here. And if you, uh, and if you haven't really th put much thought guys into what your purpose is, I would challenge you to put some thought into that and, and get it out of your brain and get it onto paper, you know, vision getting is, is what, when it's in your brain plan is getting it out on paper and then following through and doing what you put on the paper is the, is, um, that's the key to success guys. So thanks for being on. Have a great Wednesday. Appreciate each and every one of you. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys. Thanks man.